dream big never stop dreaming because you can do whatever that you want as long as you believe in your dreams welcome to the dare to dream productions podcast today we have a very special guest he's the magic behind the classic christmas movie home alone in pitch perfect please welcome julio mccat thank you for taking the time today thank you thank you for having me this is fun Let's start from the beginning. Can you talk about your process of creating a visual design for any film and the relationship between a director and a DP? I'd love to talk about that. That's something that's, uh, it's so important and few people realize what a director of photography does, you know, and it's a, it's a big title and sort of mysterious. And when you're making a movie, you have, the the basic elements are a script then you have a director who theoretically will have a vision and and an idea of of what they're going to do with that story with the script and then you have a specialist in photography who um who tries to be like the the therapist of the director and really draw out what they're truly trying to say with the story. Or um, oftentimes a director will know what they want, but they won't realize it until they see it. And that's where we come in. We bring in uh, photography in order to tell the story. And photography for us as cinematographers is composed of three main elements. The the composition side of it you know the way you frame up a picture like you take a picture of me right now you know there's composition there's uh the movement of the camera which you know helps you tell the story if if you're if you're trying to convey a lonely moment you may have you know a little boy sitting at the end of a corridor and the camera slowly pulling back and to your heart that says oh he's alone um and lighting which is arguably the most important because for us lighting sets up the mood and it sets up the situation so if the story is about someone being very sad and about to commit suicide you wouldn't have this happy lighting in that in that scene you would convey it by having you know tones of light that are on the cooler side or or uh, misty or whatever so that's the lighting component so as cinematographers we bring that to the party then we hire a crew of about 60 people lighting people grip people we oversee the art department and i like to think of ourselves cinematographers as being sort of the the gatekeepers of the image because literally there's a gate in the camera and a picture is coming through the lens and we're the last person who can say, hey, do this, do that, fix that, tweak that little thing and try to get the image to be the best it can to tell the story. It's so important, especially lighting. It definitely does could change a mood and a whole look of a film. Definitely. And with, uh, with Home Alone as an example, you know, there were times where the film was funny and light, but there were times where it was supposed to be scary too. You know, when the, when the kid goes down into the basement, it's supposed to be spooky. The house is supposed to scare him at times. And, and the mean guys, you know, shadows on the wall and stuff like that. So you have to ground the story you're trying to tell with, uh, with the photography. So that's what a director of photography does. So what was your creative process for Home Alone? The creative process, well, um, from the start, um, it, it, first of all, it was my first movie that I ever photographed, you know, that, that was sizable. I had done one little horror film that nobody saw before that. Um, I, was, I had done a job in, in what's called a second unit to a bigger film because the director who liked me said, you do all the action photography to this specific film which was called tango and cash and uh, they liked very much what i was doing so they thought oh here's a young up-and-coming guy i was almost 30 
and they thought, uh, let's put him to the studio, which at the time was Warner Brothers, thought, uh, let's put him together with, uh, with this young director, Chris Columbus, who had done a couple of films. And uh, I think that'd be a good mix for each other. So they introduced us and Chris Columbus and I hit it off. And, and from that moment on, it was, it was about, you know, trying to do something special, you know, that, that it was a little story, you know, it was, it was a story for kids. We kept referencing other movies of what we wanted it to feel like. Uh, a Christmas story was something that came up a lot. We wanted to do something that was entertaining and, and for the kids and, and, and have a vibe of, of you know the feeling of Christmas so so we just kind of uh, hit off each other and I showed him visuals that I really liked and he liked those and and that's how the creative process starts you know you you have a script and then you have a director who tells you what he's trying to do and then you bring you bring you know stuff to the party that that uh, helps that director realize what he thinks he wants. And, you know, the, the interesting thing about making movies is that you never know exactly what you're going to get until you're doing it. So it kind of builds as it goes. And what happened with Home Alone was that it, it was one of those convergences where, where every, every aspect of the movie helped the other aspect of the movie. So it was a great script. Then it had a director with, with you know, a vision of what he thought he wanted to do. Then I brought the photography to the party. Then, you know, production design. We had this great John Muto, who's a great production designer. He brought his ideas to it. And then, you know, and then we got really fortunate to have somebody like uh, Raja Gosnell, who ended up directing movies afterward. He edited the movie. And then how lucky could we get that we get John Williams, who's an iconic music person, you know, used by Spielberg and everything, uh, to be to see a rough cut of the movie and love it and say, Yeah, I'll do this and you know, comes up with these with these tunes that were just majestic and elevated everything. So it was one of those cases where every everybody was firing on all cylinders and then everything sort of converged. And, you know, I've, I've shot almost 40 movies now and I have to tell you, it's only happened like that again, once or twice in the whole time in my 35 years of filming, making movies. Wow. It doesn't happen. Yeah. It doesn't happen very often. Well, that's magic then, right? It's <laughs> pretty cool. So what visual references you said, did you take from Spielberg a little? I watched that interview. You said that one like uh, crane shot, right? Yeah, yeah. When, when, uh, when Macaulay walks towards the church and that whole church sequence was really inspired because, you know, first of all, you're shooting in a, you're filming in a church and we were trying to do the shot of the outside of the church where it's still one of my favorite shots I've ever done. And yeah, you know, you, you always uh, emulate. It's not like you imitate because in photography, it's weird. You can't even imitate yourself. You can't, you know, sometimes you do a shot and you have to come back the next day and do exactly the same shot. And it's never exactly the same. There's all these variables that changes everything. So, you know, so a, a, a tip of the hat to Spielberg, you know, and all the wonderful shots that he's ever done where the camera is down low and and on a big, beautiful shot. And then as, as a person walks away, the camera slowly rises. That's sort of a classic thing to do that's proper for the moment. So, yeah, I think I think everybody kind of, is influenced by everybody else and not not to rip off things exactly because it's never exact but yeah i i i uh you yeah, know and if you're gonna imitate somebody imitate spielberg oh yeah <laughs> he's been my favorite like ever since like the goonies and just like growing up on all his films yeah definitely beautiful stuff beautiful stuff
So this podcast is for who's my audience? Who are you showing this to? I wonder. Mostly filmmakers. Like a lot of film students watch this to get education and also just like hearing from different perspectives because we have like a lot of global filmmakers too. Yeah, yeah. And you're at DePaul, right? Yes. Yeah, I have a son who graduated from DePaul. Oh, very cool. And and my wife, who's an actor, uh, went to DePaul when DePaul was the Goodman Theater. She's an actress. Her name's Elizabeth Perkins. And she was at the, uh, at the Goodman School, which used to be, now it's part of DePaul, but it used to be attached to DePaul, and it was the theater school. I don't know if you knew that, but uh, so we have... I met my wife in Chicago. We were making a movie, the remake of Miracle on 34th Street. Aww. And that's why, as I told you, Chicago is a very special, very special place for us. You know, for me, I shot Home Alone there. Then I met my wife there. We have really good friends in <laughs> Chicago. My camera assistant on Home Alone, Lex DuPont, is now a, a big cinematographer. He's shooting one of those Chicago shows at as we speak. Uh -huh. And then um, on Home Alone, I gave a job pretty much off the street <clears throat> to <clears throat> a, a woman, African-American woman named Michelle Crenshaw, who is now a big camera operator. She was from Chicago. Oh. So there's a lot of Chicago tie-ins to, um, to my story. That's awesome. Do you visit here a lot? Yeah, we try to go there. We go visit our friend, Patty Backer, who lives in Chicago. Oh, cool. Yeah. Do you like the snow or do you hate the snow? <laughs> you know, I, I've i never been so cold as to when we were shooting Home Alone and <laughs> outside at nighttime. I remember it was so cold that the film was breaking. That's wow. how cold it was. You'd open the camera. We'd have heaters all around <clears throat> because the wind from the lake would pick up, as you well know. And uh, it just made it really cold. It's, I was so cold that one time I came back to my hotel room and I drew a bath and I went into the hot water and within five minutes the water was almost cold. That's how cold my body was. It, <laughs> it cooled out the water. <laughs> so when you shot Home Alone, did you have a specific color palette you worked with? Yeah, yeah, we did. Um, and in fact, I went as far, because it was so important to me, it was my first movie. <clears throat> I wanted to make sure that everybody in my crew was on board with the things that we had been talking about, which is something you normally don't do. Uh, but I was going by instinct, so I wanted my whole crew to know what, what our color choices were and what our influences were. So I wrote this two page sort of mission statement and I just wanted to get everybody excited about it. I, I haven't done it since, but I think it's a really good idea to, to get everybody, especially on a smaller production, you know, where it's all about the heart and, you know, the passion for doing something and getting everybody on the same page. Um, obviously the Christmas colors were important, just like what you're wearing fits perfectly <laughs> in the home a lot. And, um, <clears throat> but also we talked about the colors of when the family flies and they go to Paris, how that would be a different world. So we use a lot more blues there, you know, from, from the minute they land at the airport to the apartment they're in. We went for a much cooler feel to, to obviously separate, you know, the family in a cool environment and the boy in a very Christmassy, you know, reds and greens and gold, you know, that was our vibe. And we stuck to it pretty well. You know, it's interesting when you start um, um, controlling color, and, and you start doing things a certain way, how if a, a, a weird color comes into the mix, it stands out as being, no, 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 this doesn't belong here. So it's something that's really cool that once you start controlling, it takes a life of its own. So we have a question from John from Chicago, and he asks, 
There's a scene where Kevin wakes up alone and sees flashes of his family members saying horrible things to him. It looks like the actors were saying the lines directly to the camera. How and when were these shots conducted since it clearly wasn't part of the original scene? Yeah, it was in the script and it was sort of his imagination. What's interesting is, is that, you know, 30 years ago when we did this, visual effects were not as great as they are right now. So everything has sort of a milky feel to it. And that's because the visual effects, these dissolves that they would do uh, were not as good, but it kind of worked to the favor of the fact that it was kind of dreamy-ish and it felt like a memory. So we kind of went with it instead of worrying that, oh, these are shitty visual effects. So, so that, that goes to show you that sometimes you, you land on accidents that work. Um, it was definitely shot during the movie. Uh, we just, we wanted to distort it because to me and to our director, when you think of a memory, it's never just like clear. It's sort of so distorted. So we used distorted lenses. I think I remember it was a 14 millimeter lens and, um, uh, and the lighting was slightly different than the rest of the movie. It was cooler, I think. And, uh, and yeah, and, and everybody was with the idea that I, a kid remembers things in an amplified way. So everyone was going over the top with their, you know, there are 15 people in this house and you're the only one who wants, wants to make trouble or whatever the mother says. And um, so it was kind of an over the top memory. And that's, how we approached it visually and and that's uh that's how it works yeah he's sitting at the table and he's remembering all of this and then he shifts from being afraid to like hey i'm alone screw my family you know and you kind of see that in his face shift over and then from there i think he, he's really happy that he's by himself and jumps up and down on the bed and stuff like that yeah it's a great scene yeah so we have another question from Mariah from Texas, and she asks, there were no GoPros back then. So how did you film the POV shots of Kevin sliding down the stairs? That's a really good question. <clears throat> there were no GoPros, but we created, um, I found this tiny camera, it was about, was about the size of this, maybe a little bigger. And it was an Airy 2C camera. You can look it up. It's, it's a very, very old camera. And they made a body that was tiny that they used in, for other purposes. I think they use it for medical purposes. They call it the medical 2C camera. And then it had a, <clears throat> a just a, a short spool, a 100-foot uh, spool, which is less than a minute. So the magazine was about this big, tiny, and we used to call it bonus cam. Um, and it was a tiny little camera, which <clears throat> it kind of grew out of, I call it the chicken shit camera because <laughs> I was so scared when we started. It was my first movie and I wanted to make sure that we got everything. And we had two cameras rolling most of the time. And then we had a bonus cam, which was this tiny little camera, which uh, I had gotten used to using from doing stunts. I would place it in places, you know, close to, close to cars driving by or interesting spots, you know, where you couldn't really put a camera, but you could put bonus cam. You could just put it there, plug it into a battery, and it would just roll and get whatever it got. And it was usually a good cut for an action sequence. So when we started doing stunts, I had bonus cam, my little, my little GoPro type camera. And uh, I just started putting it in a place where I, I was afraid that something might happen in the stunt and I wouldn't catch it because it, you know, both cameras would miss it. So I would use the bonus cam as, as a, a wide and stupid shot of the thing just to have it just to make sure we didn't miss it 
So um, at first it was like, we'd put it on a stick and we'd just like fly it over like a boom microphone and just have like an aerial, you know, it was usually with a 16 millimeter lens. Um, so we started just doing that or when Pesci was going to fall on the ground, we just put it wherever we could, wherever it fit that it didn't see bad things and plop it down on the ground. And accidentally, you know, great things were starting to happen. Like Pesci would fall right in front of the lens or near it. And, and because it was so little, it was, you know, nobody even knew the camera was there. So we started to see a dailies that bonus cam was getting some really cool shit. And we went like, oh my God, bonus cam is, is, is cool. You know, we love these shots. So then we started to think, well, what else can we do with bonus cam that's kind of nutty and fun? So we put it on a rope, you know, and we'd throw it down things um, like, uh, like the one the iron comes down and hits Dan Stern in the face. Hmm. We threw bonus cam down on a rope. Uh, and that became the point of view of, of the iron hitting him, which is a great shot. Uh, and then bonus cam became kind of the star of the show. And then we started to really think about where to put our GoPro. So to answer your question in Texas, that, that's a long answer to it. But bonus cam helped to, um, to kind of design a style of, of the things we were doing, that big and wide and close then translated into other shots we did, you know, including the boy running right up to the camera and going, ah, you know, and running away. Um, those were because we saw that our GoPro was, uh, was working and we started to use it as, style, as a stylistic piece to what we were doing. Very cool. Have you used that bonus cam on other shoots? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, uh, <clears throat> you definitely, when you learn something like that, um, and, and every, any time there's a stunt that's going to happen, there's always, for me, there's always a bonus cam somewhere, you know, where it, it's just, it, it, uh, draws you into the action. So Steve from Australia wants to know what challenges did you face filming home alone? Was snow a problem or was it all fake snow? Snow was a problem, but it also, you know, like any problem, you try to um, take it to your advantage. So the very first day of filming, uh, we shot the sequence where the boy goes into the pharmacy and he gets a toothbrush and and then the old man comes in and then he runs away uh we did that we shot that whole sequence and there was a massive uh snowstorm outside to the point where we laid our cables and everything and the snowstorm came in and then we couldn't find the cables when we finished it was it was under a foot and a half of snow it was crazy we had to leave the stuff behind it was and that was on day one of filming. Um, so yeah, th there was snow when we didn't want it sometimes, but then that we adjusted to it. So after that big snowfall, we went ahead to do some of the big day exteriors where we needed the snow outside. Um, and then we couldn't get all of our work. So yes, when when we had to continue doing those exteriors, we had near us we had real ice that there's a machine that's like a, a tree chipper and you throw blocks of ice in it and it shoots out little bits of uh of ice and it looks like snow so wherever in the foreground of the scenes we had real ice chipped snow and then on the background of the scene we had potato flake snow <laughs> which was uh yeah, it's uh, it's a combination of potato flakes, you know, mass, fake mashed potatoes that they blow and then it looks like white snow and then it dissolves afterwards. So it's, and uh, and sometimes we also used um, foam 
which works if it looks like snow, except when the wind comes up in Chicago, then, then you have these bubbles blowing through the shot, which is ridiculous. But those are the three different types of snow. And yes, the snow, um, I, I remember when we did this, the church sequence, which is my favorite sequence in the movie, uh, it had been snowing. And then uh, I remember going in the church and, you know, we were just all waiting for the snow to stop. And I, I think I remember saying a little prayer. I remember talking to the priest. He was excited that we're filming at the Trinity Church. And he may or may not have given me a glass of wine. We won't get into that. <laughs> but, but, uh, and then all of a sudden, we, we walked out and he saw how nervous I was because, you know, we were running out of time. And then all of a sudden, the snow stopped. You know, I think the first AD said, oh, my God, we have Jesus on our side. <laughs> the, the snow stopped and we shot it. And it was a magical moment. Yeah. I love when that stuff happens on set. Just like the magic of filmmaking is awesome. Yeah, yeah. That's that's where film karma comes in, you know. And for all the good things you have done in the past, you, you get thrown a bone, you know, you get the right cloud, you get snow stopping, things like that. So if you had to choose only one lens to use for the rest of your life, what would it be and why? The 35 millimeter because it's a lens, you know, and I'm not the first one, uh, either a 35 or a 32. I, you'd have to think about the story. You know, one's a little bit wider, and uh, a lot of people think, including Hitchcock, that um, when you go like this, and you look out, and you're trying to see something that's, that's very, uh, very much what your eyesight is seeing without distortion. A lot of people think the 35 is that millimeter. Um, when Kubrick used to shoot um, location photographs, he would insist that all the shots be done with a 35 millimeter at a certain height of, I think it was eight feet. So you had to be on a ladder with a 35 so as to not distort the location so you could judge it just for what it is and uh, it's a lens that can work for a close-up and it can also if you get far enough back and work for a wide shot um, I'm not sure 100 percent but um, you know the movie 1917 yes. which was pretty much one lens it, it was a version of a 35 millimeter in spherical but they shot it in a 4K format, so it was close. It was close to a 35. I'd want to say in spherical, it would probably be around the 29 millimeters. What uh, what my friend Roger Deakins shot that film with. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Do you have any advice for beginner DPs? Quit. No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yes, uh, the advice is that, you know, um, if you remember sometime, if you're calling yourself a DP, sometime on that path to where you are now, you photograph something that really made your soul come to life. You did a photograph or a picture or a moving image where you went, oh my God. I love this. Uh, you know, it's it's the equivalent of in the old days, you know, you take a roll of film, you shoot all these pictures, you didn't know exactly what you got, you took it to get processed, it came back, you looked at it and there were three great surprises of three photos that you go, oh my God, I can't believe I photographed this. I, I shot this and these are good. This is great, you know? That feeling that you get of, accomplishment and excitement and the fact that you captured a moment that's passionate that has that says something and it made you glow um, this is the reason why you're a cinematographer and my advice is to try not to lose that 
to to whatever scene you're doing, whatever you're trying to tell in a story, there's usually I, I like to, I, you know, I've done a lot of movies with first time directors and, and uh, young cinematographers or, or people coming up who ask me. And I always say, you know, you can do a lot of shots for a scene. You can do, you can do a Steadicam 360, you can run around, you can go up and down. And, but if you had to do a shot, if you had to tell the story and pick one shot, one millimeter, one position, if you had to tell that story in that one angle, what would that be? And it's an interesting exercise because, you know, you're going to be in one place and oftentimes you want to be in that place at the beginning of the scene and at the end of the scene, there's a better place to be in. But uh, oftentimes you want to pick the place that tells a story in one shot and that's usually your master shot. Um, and when you pick that spot, it, it just makes it all work, you know, and you've succeeded in transforming that passionate moment that you had interpreting the story into a visual. And, uh, that would be my biggest advice is to not lose track of the one shot that tells a story and be passionate about it and do ordinary things in an extraordinary way. So that same shot, you know, could be as simple as, you know, a door is open and people far away are talking and you're seeing it from this perspective, you know, and that, that could be a shot that tells a story or there could be a keyhole and you make a bigger keyhole and you put your camera through the keyhole and that's looking at the scene in the other room. Same, similar shot, it says two completely different things. And it's the real fun of being a cinematographer is picking those little things that changes the way you tell the story. And that's the exciting thing about what we do, you know, that's, and, and, you know, a lot of it can be technical and there can be a lot of energy and time spent thinking about what camera you're going to use, what lenses you're going to use. And, and that's all well and good. But in the end, it doesn't really matter. What matters, you can shoot it with your iPhone. You know, you, what matters is the shot that you've created that tells the story. So rather than to get crazed with resolution and 4K, 2K, it's the shot that matters. And it's what makes us, you know, special in telling stories. And I would recommend that, don't lose track of that passion that makes you make that one shot. That, that would be my recommendation. I think that's great advice. Cause I feel like a lot of film students, especially, they focus on like, you know, they want to shoot with like the Ari Alexa or these like huge cameras, but they don't think about the story and why they're using specifically that camera. Too. Definitely. I mean, yeah, you want to have something that feels professional. I understand that. But it's amazing that images like Canon makes these little SLR type cameras that, you know, they really do look professional but be guided not by the equipment. The equipment is just there to record, you know? I worked with uh, uh, Antonio Banderas one time. Uh, he directed his first movie called Crazy in Alabama, which is another one of my favorite things that I photographed. Very passionate. And he's a very passionate guy, you know? And I remember one time we were doing a, a scene and you know things were late and they didn't have the right items and this and there was chaos on the set which happens a lot in student films i've witnessed it you know so everyone's running around with their heads cut off and everybody's a director and everybody ah! and uh so we do this and then okay roll 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 the camera roll the camera you know, and then you mark it and then there's a silence and then the scene happens 
and then maybe some magic happens. And uh, we cut, Antonio comes over and he says to me, and, and you know, in broken English, you know, he says, Julio, and aren't you glad that the camera doesn't have any feelings? <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at him and go, what do you mean? And he goes, yeah, it's crazy. It's insane out there. There's all kinds of hell is breaking loose. But the camera just records what's on the frame. It's not affected by the fact that everyone's in a bad mood. It just registers it. So it's interesting that oftentimes you can, you know, just have your recorder guided into what you really want to do and not the madness of everything else that's going on outside of it. And that's why it's really important for us to feel, as cinematographers, to feel like the keepers, the gatekeepers, you know, the keepers of the image. We, we're there to make sure that there's not a label on the, you know, a tag in the wardrobe or, you know, an imperfection in the makeup that's terrible. We're there for that and that's a responsibility. So it's a big responsibility that everybody's effort, everybody's job for the costumes and props, everything is ruined unless the keeper of the image says, hey, 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 look at that. That's, is that what we want? You know, without embarrassing anybody, but you know, things happen on a film set. And uh, that's the fun part of it. That's the fun part of what we do too. So the pandemic has impacted a lot about the film industry, like set protocols, movie theaters being shut down, streaming and, like everything else. So what do you think the future of filmmaking is from like a cinematography standpoint? Well, we're hopefully all gonna, you know, the, the interesting thing about um, being on a film set is you're always adapting. You're always changing to adapt to, to get to the other side of the problem. We're problem solvers by nature. So of course we're gonna figure out that, you know, if, if, if everybody's wearing masks and if everybody's testing, we should be able to get back on a set and be safe. We're safe when we're doing stunts. We're safe when, you know, they put 20 gallons of gasoline and there's gonna be a tremendous explosion and you have four cameras in the near vicinity of it. You're, you're gonna figure out how not to kill people. So it makes sense that we would, we would be smart enough to, to try to get around it. I'm hoping, you know, I've had three different projects fall apart after they prepared, uh, unfortunately, because of COVID. And, uh, and it's sad, but we will come back to normal, you know, eventually. I think I'm dying to get back to a theater and see something the way it was meant to happen on a big screen, you know. And, I hope that that people don't forget that experience because when we're making a movie, we're creating the experience, not to sit, you know, on a monitor or at home on a little screen, you know, even if it's a 60 inch, whatever, it's still not the experience that we love sitting in a movie theater. We'll get back to it, you know, in a year or so, I think. But, um, and we have to shoot for that. We can't all of a sudden become these quibby, you know, people that are gonna watch our work on a cell phone. I hate that. You know, we're an image is meant to be projected and meant to be, you know, shown in, in all its glory, everybody's effort from the from like I said, from the wardrobe to the makeup to the hairstyles to the set design, all of it. It's appreciated on a big screen. And we shouldn't lose track of that. And we'll get back to that, but it's gonna take some time. I definitely miss movie theaters, that's for sure. I know, so, we're out there gonna smooch in the dark. Come on. <laughs> I'm sorry to hear about the films, but I think, yeah, once things go back to more normal, I think it will be good. So what's, what's next for you? I don't know. I'm I'm reading a script now and it's possible. We'll see. You know, I don't want to jinx it. 
but uh, it could happen in in March. I'm hoping. Um, I'm kind of gun shy because I prepared three movies, and then the week before, one of them, the actor didn't want to commit to it because of COVID. The other one, um, they came to the conclusion that it was too expensive to do all the proper COVID testing and the budget just couldn't accommodate it. Um, and um, so I'm open, I'm open. Maybe you guys will write something amazing and send it to me. <laughs> that would be awesome. We do have a lot of like talented people on this team, so. Well, yeah. anything is possible, you know, shoot high shoot high and you don't get a second chance to make a first impression. So if you're gonna send the script to somebody, make sure it's the very best script you could write because you know, that person could say, yeah, I'll read it. And then it's gotta be good, you know, cause that's your shot. So I, I would say my other, my other recommendation to young filmmakers is that before you roll that camera or before you finish your project, ask yourself, have I done everything I can possibly do to make this something that excites me and I would want to go see? Or, you know, don't just do it as an assignment. Do it as if it means everything, because it does. It means everything. If you want to be in our industry, you know, the people who don't survive are the people who are washing dishes with lukewarm water is the people who have to work with hot water you know you you want to you want to go for it you want to make a statement you want to make it count you want people to remember your work so it shouldn't be half-assed it should be the very best you can possibly do and the beauty of our industry too is you know you have a hundred years of history of amazing movies like you, you could Go back to every movie that won the Oscar, you know, for the next 50 years, say, and and really uh, from those, there's something that's going to speak to you. That's going to say, oh, yeah, I love that movie. I loved Out of Africa. I loved, you know, whichever movie you pick. And there's a reason why you loved it. And there's a reason that that may have something to do with your taste. and developing your taste if you love that maybe do your version of that i mean look at all the great stuff we have to to as as background research we have you know our we we have the american society of cinematographers is 100 years old 100 years ago some dude figured out that you could pass film quickly through a gate and get an image and here we are trying to do the same thing. Well, it better be a good picture. Somebody worked their ass off to figure out how, how to make movies. So, you know, just set, set, set your sights high on your projects. And, you know, uh, I think that we're all storytellers and the more, the more that you're influenced and the more passionate you are about telling your story, the more that you'll be guided in the right direction. Thank you so much for joining us. Good luck, you guys. Kick ass. Do great work. <laughs> <laughs>